Okay. I want to welcome you to the first full installment of A Call for Discernment. This session is entitled Dangerous Doctrines. Uh, this session we will be looking at the metaphysical cultic origins of the movement and the standard doctrines which the faith preachers espouse that deviate from Orthodox Christianity. So where did the Word of Faith movement begin? Well, it began with a man named Phineas Parkhurst Quimby. Quimby was the father of New Thought, a metaphysical cult. Now let me define a couple of terms here for us. When I say metaphysical, I know that's a big $3 word, but really all metaphysical means is beyond the physical realm, beyond what we can see. And when I say cult, you might have images of people dressed in black robes, wearing a black hood, standing around a pentagram, worshiping Satan. That would qualify, but that's not what we mean here by cult. A, a quote-unquote Christian cult is any group or sect that calls itself Christian, and yet they deny some of the fundamental doctrines of the faith. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses belong to a cult. Mormonism is a cult because they compromise, deny some of the fundamentals of our faith. So. Quimby, the great-grandfather of the Word of Faith movement, was the father of the metaphysical cult known as New Thought. He was also a student of occultism, hypnosis, and parapsychology. And I believe that much of the behavior that we'll look at in the next session, mangled manifestations, can be attributed to some of these disciplines. His theoretical formulation served as the basis for the mind science cult, also known as Christian science, which was founded properly by Mary Baker Eddy and his theoretical formulations later served as a basis for the theology of the modern Word of Faith movement. So Quimby is the one that first began to articulate some of the doctrines that we see today. Essek W. Kenyon is the grandfather of the Word of Faith movement. Uh, Kenyon is recognized by all your modern prosperity preachers as uh, the grandfather of this movement, they would all appeal to Kenyon. And I've been in Kenneth Copeland's bookstore before. You look in there and there's Essex Kenyon material all over the shelves. And uh, Kenyon himself had very clear ties to the metaphysical cults, particularly New Age and New Thought. He was heavily influenced by them. He attended college at the Emerson School of Oratory where the metaphysical cults were pl prominent and they flourished. Now, I want us to look at a few of the doctrines that Kenyon taught. Number one, Kenyon taught that God created not ex nihilo, as we call it, not out of nothing, but rather God created by speaking faith-filled words. And we as believers can do the same thing. Kenyon held essentially that faith was a tangible substance, and when God spoke, his words were containers of the substance called faith, almost like Tupperware containers that carried the substance of faith. So his words of faith is what created the worlds and everything that we see. And we as believers can use our own words of faith to speak things into existence to create our own physical reality. Kenyon held that humans took on the nature of Satan in the fall when this happened, they forfeited to Satan their supposed deity and made Satan the legal god of planet Earth. Kenyon held that Jesus died not only a physical death, but he also died a spiritual death, where Jesus suffered, was tormented in hell, died spiritually, and had to be reborn. And that is where the real atonement of our sins took place, not on the cross, but in hell. And finally, Kenyon held that health and wealth are obtainable by the believer's positive confession. So if we need money, we can speak it into existence. If we need healing, we can speak it into existence. Kenyon did hold to many of the fundamental doctrines of Orthodox Christianity. However, what's happened in the modern Word of Faith movement is that your modern prosperity preachers like Benny Hinn and Kenneth Copeland have taken Kenyon's mistakes and made them much worse. So compared to your modern prosperity preachers, Essex W. Kenyon was actually fairly orthodox. 
Some of you may remember this gentleman. William Branham was the father of the post-World War II healing revival movement. Branham is the one that first began to popularize some of these tent healing meetings. Let's look at some of his doctrines. Branham taught that only those who accepted his teachings would be saved. So if you disagreed with William Branham, then you were just out of luck. Branham held that Eve had relations with the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Branham thought very highly of himself. He proclaimed himself to be the angel of Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. He just read himself right into Scripture. And Paul Crouch, founder and president of TVN a few years ago, did the very same thing. Paul Crouch said, said that he found his name hidden in an Old Testament Bible code using equidistant lettering. So Paul Crouch reads himself right into God's Word, too. Branham prophesied that all of the world's denominations would be consumed by the Roman Catholic-controlled World Council of Churches. And Branham said that this would happen in 1977, just before the rapture and the destruction of the world. Well, guess what didn't happen? And finally, Branham taught that the doctrine of the Trinity was a demonic doctrine. Listen to the following audio clip of William Branham and then listen to Benny Hinn's endorsement of him. Now, my precious brother, I know this is a tape also. Now, don't get excited. Let me say this with godly love. The hours approach where I can't hold still on these things no more. It's too close yeah, to the country, man. See? Trinitarianism is of the devil. I'll say that. Thus saith the Lord. God uses normal individuals. Whether it's Smith Wigglesworth or Catherine Kuhlman or Amy or A. Allen or William Branham. Great men of God. There you just heard Benny Hinn, one of the most widely recognized individuals, leaders in Christianity today, call William Branham a great man of God. This is a man who denounced the Trinity as a demonic doctrine. There's an astonishing lack of discernment in our churches today. And uh, William Branham died, as you see, in 1965. He had prophesied that he would be raised from the dead when he did die, and believe it or not, to this very day, uh, in, at Branham's tomb place, they'll, uh, there's a small group of Branhamites that will gather every Easter Sunday morning around his tomb waiting for that old boy to come back up. And uh, I think they'll be waiting for quite a while. Kenneth Hagin is the father of the modern Word of Faith movement. And uh, though Kenneth Hagin claimed that no believer should die before age 120, you see that he died here at age 86. Now, Kenneth Hagin, like almost all of the Word of Faith preachers, claim that much of what they teach you, they receive directly from divine revelation knowledge from Jesus himself. And this is almost like their fallback position and their way of insulating themselves from any biblical criticism. And they'll say essentially that, well, if you can't find what I'm teaching you in the Word, don't worry about it, you see, because I have it from the highest authority. Jesus himself came and gave me these teachings. And um, Kenneth Hagin claimed to have received eight personal visitations from Christ. And in one of these visitations, Jesus supposedly gave him the following teaching. Um, this deals with what we'll look at in a little bit called the spiritual death of Jesus, but Hagen claimed that he received these words directly from Jesus himself. It's interesting, however, that Jesus bears a striking resemblance to Essek W. Kenyon. If you can see here, it's practically word for word identical. Hagen did not receive this from Jesus. Hagen plagiarized Essek W. Kenyon. And this is just all I could fit on the screen, but this information is quite voluminous. It goes on and on and on. Uh, Hagen did not receive this from Christ. He plagiarized Kenyon. And yet listen to the following audio clip of Gloria Copeland perpetuating this myth. You say, why do y'all talk so much about Kenneth Hagen when you do this? Because he's where we learned how to walk in the Spirit, how we learned what we learned. How did he know it? 
He had the very unusual experience mm -hmm. of Jesus himself coming to teach him these things, and then he called him to teach all of us. And so that's why, and that's where we learn it. It'll be a blessing to you. The faith preachers are very fond of claiming divine origin for what they teach, yet you can see the origins of their teachings are not nearly so supernatural. Kenneth Copeland is without a doubt one of the most intelligent and articulate proponents of word faith theology, but as we shall see as we go along today, he is also very, very dark. And this man probably needs no introduction. Benny Hinn, uh, the world's greatest quote-unquote faith healer in all the world today. Two of the leading lights in word faith theology. I want to show you this quote now from Essek Kenyon, dealing with occultic origins. Kenyon writes, We cannot ignore the amazing growth of Christian science, unity, new thought, spiritism. We cannot close our eyes to the fact that in many of our cities on the Pacific coast, Mrs. Eddy has a stronger following today and a larger attendance at her churches than have the old line denominations. The people have left them because they believe they are receiving more help from Mrs. Eddy's teaching than from preachers. They will tell you how they were healed and how they were helped in their spiritual life by this strange cult. So by his own admission, Kenyon believed that these metaphysical cults had really tapped into some power. Now he wanted to, and I really think in a good faith effort, he wanted to try to to take some of these cultic doctrines and, and teach them as truth, but he, he just believed that these cults had tapped into some power and we as Christians can have that same power. And he, so he tried to Christianize some of these cultic doctrines and that remains true to this day. Now let's look at some of the standard doctrines which the faith preachers teach. We will begin with the doctrine of positive confession. Uh, consider these clips as illustrative of this teaching. Look at me, say, 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 all, all of you, say, there's power in me, power in me. To, speak life and death. to speak life and death. You call what you have, you say what you want. And I'm here to tell you, I know that I know that I know that as these programs are airing, I, I'm speaking something into existence. Amen. I'm speaking something into existence. If that sounds eerily like God's act of creation in Genesis 1 and 2, that's because it is. Dear friends, only God can speak things into existence. That is not an ability that you and I have. And we'll see as we go along that one of the fundamental problems of the faith movement is that the faith preachers blur what should be a very crisp line of distinction between God the Creator and us His created. They demote God to make Him look more human than what He is, and then they deify man to make us look a lot more like God than what we really are. Consider this from Gloria Copeland. Don't see yourself uh, pitiful, depressed, without, broke, Get into the Word. If you're having pro uh, financial problems, get into the Word until you see yourself prosperous. We saw ourselves prosperous before we got prosperous. Now, you may have seen that and you're wondering, well, Justin, what's so bad about that? She's just talking about having a positive outlook on life. No, it's something a bit more serious than that. What she's talking about is something known as visualization. And visualization is a New Age technique in which you visualize things with your mind and when you visualize these things in your mind they will then become physical reality and this by the way is very very similar to what Oprah Winfrey is teaching in this thing called the secret you've heard about Oprah Winfrey promoting the secret see a lot of nodding heads same kind of thing uh, and it, it, these cultic ideas will pop up in different places. It'll pop up in Oprah Winfrey and The Secret, and they'll pop up in Word of Faith and, and the contemplative prayer movement, the emergent movement, and it just, it's the same basic heresy. It just rears its head in, in different places. Uh, to further flesh this out from Gloria Copeland, uh, this quotation from her husband, Kenneth Copeland. Kenneth Copeland says, when you get to the place where you take the Word of God and you build an image on the inside of you of not having crippled legs, not having blind eyes, 
But when you close your eyes, you just see yourself leap out of that wheelchair. It will picture that in the Holy of Holies, and you will come out of there. You will come out. So, according to Kenneth Copeland, all I need to do is sit up here and close my eyes and think real hard and imagine myself not having cerebral palsy, not having my crutches, and when I concentrate hard enough, that image will materialize in the Holy of Holies, and then I'll just open my eyes and be healed. Friends, that is foreign to the Word of God. That is foreign to the Word of God. It's right at home in the metaphysical cults, but foreign to God's Word. This from Benny Hinn. Benny Hinn said this on TBN one day. He said, I had a witch tell me this. Now, there's his first problem. <laughs> there's his first problem. Benny Hinn is learning spiritual truths, not from the Bible under the direction of leadership of the Holy Spirit, but from a witch. She said, you know that we are taught in witchcraft how to kill birds with words and how to kill people with our mouth. We were taught with words to bring disease on men by speaking words that would defeat them. She said, with words, I used to kill birds. I used to kill birds. She said she would speak to a bird and the bird would drop dead. I said, dear God, I didn't know the devil had such power. And the Lord spoke to me, notice the source of his authority, and he said, the devil can kill with words, then you with your words can bring life. And it just come and clicked inside of me, brother, and we Christians don't realize the power in our mouths. Dear friends, only God can bring life with the words that he speaks. That is not something that you and I can do. Only God can do that. This from T.D. Jakes. T.D. Jakes says, that word of God is how God procreates. It's how God regenerates. I didn't know God was decaying. And that's why once you get in the word of God, you've got to be careful what you speak to because the power of life and death is in your tongue. Is this true? Is there any scriptural support that the power of life and death is in our tongue? Well, upon first consideration, it might would seem so. Faith preachers would all appeal to Proverbs 18.21, which says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Well, it doesn't say right there that the power of life and death is in our tongue. Well, not exactly. Let's, let's be good Bereans, search the scriptures to see if these things are really so. As is common with the faith preachers, they only want to quote to you part of a verse, or if they quote the whole verse, they'll take it out of its context. And that's what's happening here. Let's look at Proverbs 18.21 in its entirety. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So when you look at this verse in its entirety, it doesn't exactly say what the faith preachers claim it does. In fact, I want you to read uh, what Alan P. Ross says about this verse in the Expositor's Bible Commentary. He says, those who enjoy talking, in other words, indulging in it, must bear its fruit, whether good or bad. The lesson is to be warned, especially if you love to talk. You see, dear friends, this verse is not saying that we have the power of life and death. and our, like, we can't, It's not saying we can speak life into existence. This is a warning to us. So, in other words, if you're one of those people that likes to uh, talk a little bit too much, you like to gossip, indulge in gossip, uh, you better be ready to bear the consequences of it. This is not saying we can speak life and death. This is a warning. It is a caution. Consider these clips. Birds are containers for power. They carry creative or destructive power, positive or negative power. And so we need to be speaking right things over our lives and about our futures if we expect to have good things happen. Because what you say today is what you'll probably end up having tomorrow. Speak with your mouth what you believe in your heart. You'll have whatever you say. We don't have to pray for your will, Lord. And that same Holy Spirit wants to send spiritual light to a darkened world today. But he's waiting for you and me to say, Oh, that spoken word is the key. Speak that thing. Decree that thing and it shall come to pass whatever it is in your life that you're decreeing right as now. we speak a thing together it intensifies it it as john says it supercharges it you've got to say it you've got to speak it you've got to s decree it you decree the thing you pay your vow and then he brings it to pass it's in the word it's all through the book what do you need i need money then start creating it start speaking about it 
Start speaking it into being. Speak to your billfold. Say, you big, thick billfold full of money. Speak to your checkbook. Say, you checkbook, you've never been so prosperous since I owned you. You're just jammed full of money. You've got pain and disease in your body. Speak to your body. God will create the fruit of your lips. Say to your body, your whole body. Why, you just function so beautifully and so well. Why, body, you never have any problems. You're a strong, healthy body. Or speak to your leg, or speak to your foot, or speak to your neck, or speak to your back. And once you have spoken, believe that you've received, and don't go back on it. Speak to your wife, speak to your husband, speak to your circumstances, and speak faith to them, do great to them, and God will create what you're speaking. So, according to Marilyn Hickey, next time you find yourself a little low in cash, don't worry about it, just reach into your pocket. Back pocket, pull out your wallet and start talking to it. Y'all be sure and let me know how that works out for you. Well, what of this doctrine that faith is a substance that we can manipulate? Is, is there any truth to this? Is there any scriptural support? Well, upon first consideration, might would seem so. Hebrews 11.1, 1. now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Well, it doesn't say right there that faith is a substance. Well, we'll come back to this verse, but first I want you to listen to this audio clip of Kenneth Copeland and Paul Crouch. Well, the force of faith is, in the spiritual realm, a great deal like certain forces in the natural realm. It's a spiritual force, like gravity is a natural force, electricity is a mm. natural force force of power. It's a mm -hmm. powerful thing. A measurable, natural yeah, force. It's a measurable uh, mm -hmm. force. It's conductible. Mm -hmm. It's perceptible to the touch. Um, faith is a spiritual force. It's perceptible. It's, uh, it is a tangible force. It's an invisible force. So is gravity, mm -hmm. but it's there. So is electricity. So according to Keith Copeland, faith is a physical, tangible force. Well, let's go back to Hebrews 11.1, 1, but this time I want us to look at it in the New American Standard translation. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. A little bit different take on Hebrews 11.1, 1, is it not? Well, the word in question here that the King James renders as substance and the New American Standard renders as assurance in the Greek is the word hypostasis. And the word hypostasis literally means assurance. That's what that word means. It does not mean a physical, tangible substance. Now, am I saying that the King James is wrong? Nope, that's not what I'm saying at all. Uh, the King James isn't wrong, it's just that English has evolved quite a bit in the last 400 years. Somebody reading the King James rendering of that 400 years ago would have understood perfectly well what the intent was but our language has just changed. That word has a different connotation today than it did back then. So the word literally means assurance. It does not mean a physical, tangible substance. Consider this audio clip of Kenneth Copeland and Paul and Jan Crouch. Does God use faith? Surely. Now, now see, here's a sore spot. There are those not with who him. say? No, not, not with you. No, no, no. <laughs> not with God. In fact, I'm not sore at God at all, and I don't think he's sore at me. I don't. I haven't done anything to him. <laughs> no, but the the critics say God is God. He doesn't have to have faith. He doesn't exercise faith. He doesn't use faith. He's God. He's the object of faith. Oh wait a minute. What does that mean? Object? I don't know what that means. I don't either. Okay. Kenneth Copeland said, now, wait a minute, what's that mean, God's the object of our faith? I don't know what that means. And then you hear Jan Crouch say, well, I don't either. Friends, that's not meat. That's milk. The fact that God is the object of our faith, that's first grade Sunday school stuff. And it's astonishing to me that these people who claim to be some of our leaders don't understand the elementary truth that God is the object of our faith. Because you see, in their system, He's not the object of faith. Faith is the object of faith. You see, in word faith theology, faith is not placed in God. Faith is a force that you direct at God.
to make him do what you want him to do. And it's rather ironic when you think about it that these people who call themselves faith preachers have a fundamental misunderstanding of what faith actually is. The following video clip is one of the more bizarre clips I've ever come across dealing with the doctrine of positive confession. This from Gloria Copeland. You know, you're, the, you're supposed to control the weather. I mean, Ken's the primary weatherman at our house, but when he's not there, I do it. You can see what's happening out there. It shows just like they have on at the weather, like on the news. I mean, he's got the computer, has got the current weather on it and all that for flying. So uh, sometimes I'll hear something. I'll hear the thunder start. Maybe he'll still be asleep. And I'll say, Ken, you need to do something about this. <laughs> and knowing that. But you are the one that has authority over the weather. One day, Ken and Pat Boone, we were in Hawaii at their house, and we were, they were sitting outside, and there was a weather spout out over the ocean. And that's like a tornado, except it hits the water. And so they were sitting there, and they just watched it, rebuked it. It never did anything. One day, I was in the airplane in the back, and my little brother was in the back with me, and Ken was up front flying. And we were not in the weather, because we don't fly bad weather. But we, we could see the weather over here. And I looked out the window, and that tornado came down just like this, down toward the ground. And Ken said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You get back up there. So this is how I learned how to talk to tornadoes. I saw this. And that tornado went, whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> Even while I was watching him, my little brother was not a devout Christian at that time, and that was really good for him to see. <laughs> so you're the weatherman. You get out there, or the weather woman, whichever it is, and you talk to that thing, and you tell it, you're not coming here, I command you to dissipate, and you get back up there in Jesus' name. Glory to God. That, that, I won't charge you extra. That almost doesn't even really deserve a comment, but I will offer one briefly. If it is true, and that's a huge if, but if it is true that Gloria Copeland can control the weather by the words that she speaks, then I would submit to you that Gloria Copeland is one of the most wretched people alive on the face of the earth today. Might we ask where she was when a little storm named Hurricane Katrina rolled into town? Might we ask where she was just a couple weeks ago when Hurricane Ike rolled in? Why does she not right now get on her brand new $25 million private jet and fly to some of these drought-stricken countries in eastern Africa and talk those starving people up some rain? This is what is being portrayed as Christian. And let us remember that what much of the world believes about Christianity, it gets from Christian television. And this is what it's seen. Speaking to storms and making them go away, does it remind you of someone else who one day was in a boat with his disciples and a storm came up and he spoke to the storm and calmed it? Sound familiar? You see what the faith preachers are doing. They are blurring that line between God the Creator and us His created. For a little bit different take on the account of Jesus speaking to storms and making them go away. This from Joel Osteen. One time Jesus was on a boat asleep and all of a sudden this huge storm arose. The winds were so strong. They were batting the boat back and forth. And the disciples got all upset and all afraid. And they finally ran back there and said, Jesus, get up. We're about to die. We're about to perish. And Jesus got up and he simply spoke to the storm. He said, peace, be still. And all of a sudden, there was a great calm. And the reason Jesus was able to bring peace to that situation was because he had peace on the inside. He was in the storm, but he didn't let the storm get in him. Jesus was able to speak to the storm because he had peace on the inside. Now, I'm going to go out on a theological limb here and wonder, might it have had anything to do with the fact that Oh, I don't know, that, that he was God? <laughs> I mean, I know it's a stretch, but might it have had something to do with the fact that he was God in human flesh? I don't know. Speaking to storms, making them go away, something that only God can do, 
is a good segue into our next doctrine, the little God's doctrine. All of the faith preachers teach that if you are saved, you are, in fact, a little God. Consider this exposition of Genesis 1, 26 and 27 from Creflo Dollar. Now, in verse 26 and verse 27, God now submits himself to this principle of everything producing after its own kind. And in verse 26 and 27, let's read it out loud. Ready? Read. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now that's interesting because if everything produces after its own kind, we now see God producing man. And if God now produces man, and everything produces after its own kind, if horses get together, they produce what? And if dogs get together, they produce what? If cats get together, they produce what? But if the Godhead gets together and say, let us make man, then what are they producing? They're producing gods. Now, I got to hit this thing real hard in the very beginning because I ain't got time to go through all this. But I'm going to say to you right now, you are gods, little g. You are gods because you came from God and you are gods. You're not just human. The only human part about you is this physical body that you live in. The real me is just like God. The real me is just like God. Creflo Dollar's teaching that he just gave is so heretical on so many levels, it's hard to even know where to begin. The first is that he draws analogies from animals coming together and procreating, and he draws that analogy to the triune Godhead. It's blasphemous. But also, dear friends, when the Bible says that God created man in his image, that means that as human beings, you and I are the pinnacle of God's creation. We're the pinnacle of his creation. And we have, we're created in his image in that we have the potential and the capacity through a saving relationship with Jesus Christ to know God. But dear friends, that does not mean that we are God. You know, I love dogs. I think dogs are great. I just love dogs. But the greatest, smartest dog in the world will never know God because he's not created in his image. You and I are. So we have the potential and the capacity through Jesus Christ to know God, but that does not mean we are God. The Bible is very clear that there is only one God, and we ain't him. That's not very good grammar, but that's pretty good theology. There's only one God. Now, some of you may be wondering, well, doesn't it say in the Bible somewhere that we are gods? Well, the faith preachers say that there is, and they would all appeal to John chapter 10, 30 through 34. Put this up on the screen and read it. Jesus says, I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone you not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, Ye are gods? The faith preachers say, See, here Jesus is saying to these individuals, He's saying, is, Doesn't it say in your law that you are gods? Well, the passage to which Jesus is referring is this one, Psalm 82. Verse 6 and 7, I, Asaph, 
Asaph have said, Ye are gods, you are all sons of the Most High. But you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Now, indeed, in Psalm 82, judges are called gods, but not because of their deity. They're called gods in reference to their status. In other words, these, these judges were put in positions in which they had to make decisions about matters of life and death. So in that sense, they were kind of uh, acting in a sense. They were doing some of the things, you know, taking on some of the, the responsibilities of God, making decisions of life and death. These judges were put in these positions. But it's very clear. Look at verse 7. Asaph said to these judges, he said, but you shall die like men and fall like any one of the princes. So Asaph, I believe what Asaph here is doing here is he was using sarcasm. He was saying, you, you think you're gods, but, but you're going to die just like everyone else dies. I think he was using sarcasm. And so what Jesus was doing by employing this verse, he is saying what these judges were in theory, at least, or what they were by some, how some people esteem them, I am in reality. So Jesus was making a very clear statement and declaration of his deity. This is not at all teaching that men or women are gods. This is really taking this verse out of context. And the faith preachers should know that. If the faith preachers are honest, what they are teaching, this little God's doctrine is very similar to a heresy known as henotheism. Henotheism. What is henotheism? Well, henotheism is the belief that there are many gods, but that only one is really worthy of our worship. Who else believes in henotheism? The cults of Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses do as well. Not very good company that the faith preachers are keeping. Consider this audio clip from Kenneth Copeland. The Bible said he measured the heavens with a nine-inch span. Now, the span is the difference, the distance between the end of the thumb and the end of the little finger. And, and that Bible said, in fact, the Amplified Translation translates the Hebrew text that way, that he measured out the heavens with a nine-inch span. Well, I got a ruler and measured mine, and my span's eight and three-quarter inches long. So now God's span is a quarter of inch, a quarter inch longer than mine. So you see, that faith didn't come billowing out of some giant monster somewhere. It came out of the heart of a being that is very uncanny the way he's very much like you and me. A being that stands somewhere around 6'2", six, 6'3", that weighs somewhere in the neighborhood of a couple of hundred pounds, a little better, has a span of eight and, I mean, nine inches across, stood up and said, Light be! And this universe situated itself and went into motion. Glory to God. So according to Kenneth Copeland, God is a being that stands 6'2", six, 6'3", six, weighs a couple of hundred pounds. Sounds awfully human, doesn't he? Now let's carry this out to its logical conclusion. If God is 6'2", six, 6'3", six, weighs a couple of hundred pounds, that means what? That means he's in a body. And if God is in a body, that means he cannot be everywhere at the same time, which means he's not omnipresent, and that's not the God of the Bible. If they preach a different God, they preach a different gospel. I want us now to look at the doctrine of the fall. This is really going to help us to understand the word faith movement. We're about to take a big leap forward in our understanding of word faith theology when we look at what they teach about the doctrine of the fall. And there are several items here. You might want to write these down if you're able to do so. Number one, the faith preachers teach that Adam was an exact duplicate of God. He was not a little like God. He was not a lot like God. He was God. That God literally reproduced himself in Adam. And Adam was a carbon copy of Yahweh. And according to Kenneth Hagin, Adam could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with God and have no consciousness of inferiority whatsoever. Adam was another Yahweh. Well, we all know the story, right? Adam sinned, which, of course, begs the question. 
if Adam was Yahweh and he sinned, was it Yahweh who sinned? You see, you carry these doctrines out to their logical conclusion. You see how dark they are. But when Adam sinned, he lost his deity, transferred it to Satan. And when this happened, the real Yahweh God was kicked out of planet Earth and banished from it. And so now, even as we speak today, the real Yahweh God is up there somewhere, but he has no access to planet Earth. He's been kicked out, gone. See you later. Bye. Well, somebody has to fill that void, right? So Satan is all too eager to step up to the plate, and he becomes the legal God of planet Earth. Well, guess what happens when a person gets saved? According to faith theology, guess what he gets back? Oh, he gets his godhood back. He becomes deity again. He becomes God again, just like Adam was before he fell. And this, dear friends, is why the faith preachers hold so tenaciously to health and wealth. Because we're gods. And a god cannot be poor, and a god certainly cannot be sick. You see, for years I thought this movement was just health and wealth prosperity. No, health and wealth prosperity are just the tips of the theological iceberg. They're just offshoots of a much more serious core theological problem. And let me also say this about the prosperity gospel. Now, the health and wealth prosperity gospel essentially says this. Come to Jesus because he'll make you wealthy and he'll heal your body. Two of the most basic and universal of all human desires. Most people want to be wealthy. And I don't know anyone who enjoys being sick. And the prosperity gospel says, come to Jesus and you can have it. They appeal to two of the most basic, universal of all human desires. And so hordes of people, millions of them, flock to this gospel. And they, quote unquote, come to Christ. But is that the real gospel? Or is the real gospel something a little bit more like this? Come to Jesus because you realize you're a sinner. And because of your sin, the wrath of God abides on you. And the only way to escape that wrath is to repent of your sins and place your trust in the Savior. That's the real gospel. And so, friends, you have all these millions of people that are coming to Christ, but they're responding to a different gospel. And if you come to Christ for the wrong reasons, then what you have is a false decision, a false conversion. How many millions of people have responded to this prosperity gospel and now think they're saved, but they've never truly come to grips with the fact that they're a sinner? They have to repent of sins and place their trust in the Savior. Consider this clip from Benny Hinn and Miles Monroe. The only creature that God gave authority in the earth legally to is a spirit in a dirt body. That means any spirit without a body is illegal on planet earth. But here's the bigger statement. Even God himself is illegal on earth. Why? Because he is a spirit. And the law he set up by his own mouth was that only spirits with bodies can function on earth legally. That's why God could not interfere when Adam and Eve was, you know, con uh, kind of de deliberating on the fruit environment there in the book of Genesis. I mean, it, it bothered me. I'm sure it bothered you for years as a pastor. Uh, if God is so mighty, powerful, awesome, omnipotent, omniscient, why couldn't this mighty God who made 500 million planets and galaxies could not stop a skinny little woman from picking a fruit to destroy his whole program? I mean, come on, God, aren't you powerful? You can intervene, you can destroy the works of the devil, prevent the woman, and save humanity. But he couldn't. Not that he didn't, he couldn't. God couldn't. Why couldn't he? Because he'd been kicked out of planet Earth. This from Benny Hinn and Miles Monroe. Pastor, we get the mind of God about his will, we pray it. When we pray it, we give him legal right to perform it. Yes. Let me define prayer for you in this show. Prayer is man giving God permission or license to interfere in earth's affairs. In other words, prayer is earthly license for heavenly interference. 
That's incredible. That is incredible. God could do nothing on earth. Nothing has God ever done on earth without a human giving him access. So he's always looking for that somebody. Always looking for a human to give him power, permission. In other words, God has the power, but you get the permission. God got the authority and the power, but you got the license. So even though God could do anything, he can only do what you permit him to do. God can only do what we permit him to do. Dear friends, I would submit to you this morning that God can do whatever he jolly well wants to do. And you know, I don't think he's all that interested in whether or not he has our permission to do it. Now, if God can only do what we permit him to do, who's really in control here? We are. You see, it is a very man-centered system. It is not theocentric. It is not centered on God. This gospel is absolutely centered on man. And any gospel that is centered on man, rather than the person and the work of Jesus Christ, is a different gospel. It's a different gospel. And dear friends, a different gospel does not save. This from Kenneth Copeland. I was shocked when I found out who the biggest failure in the Bible actually is. Okay. You know, everybody asks, you say, who's the biggest failure? They say, Judas. Somebody else will say, no, I believe it's Adam. Well, how about the devil? He's the most consistent failure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but he's not the biggest in terms of material failure and so forth. The biggest one in the whole Bible is God. Mm. Oh, what, what, what? Don't you turn that set off. <laughs> you listen to what? You, I told you now, you sit still a minute. You know me well enough. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell something I can't prove in the Bible. Can you imagine saying that God is the biggest failure in the Bible? He lost his top-ranking, most anointed angel, the first man he ever created, first woman he ever created, the whole earth and all the fullness therein, a third of the angels at least. That's a big loss, man. I mean, you figure all that, that's a lot of real estate, brother, gone down the drain. Now, the reason you don't think of God as a failure is he never said he's a failure. <laughs> no. And you're not a failure till you say you're one. So we never think of God as a failure just because he never owned up to being one. But in actuality, you see, he really is. Friends, that is blasphemy. To teach that God is the biggest failure, to teach that God is any kind of a failure, that is blasphemy. And I wonder if it's ever dawned on Kenneth Copeland that when Adam and Eve fell, that's not something that caught God off guard. That's not something that took him by surprise. The Bible says that the Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. And it's blasphemy to teach that God is any kind of a failure. It's unbelievable. What of this doctrine that Satan is the legal God of planet Earth? Is there any scriptural support for this? Well, upon first consideration, it might would seem so. Second Corinthians 4.4, 4, Paul writes, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. And uh, Satan is not named here specifically, but pretty much everyone agrees that Paul is here talking about Satan. And doesn't Paul call Satan the God of this world? Well, yes and no. Let's be good Brians. Let's search the scriptures to see if these things are really so. The word that we need to key in on here is this word I have highlighted, world. Now, if Paul had wanted to refer to this dirt and rock planet on which you and I are now sitting, he would have used the words Gia or cosmos, which would literally refer to this dirt and rock sphere on which you and I are now sitting that is rotating on its axis and revolving around the sun. But that's not the word Paul used. The word Paul used in the Greek is the word aeon which literally means age. So you see, Paul here is not making 
a legal statement. He's making a theological point. In essence, what Paul is saying is, is that this world, <clears throat> excuse me, this world is so sinful, so fallen, so depraved, that it follows after Satan as if he were the god of this age, but not the legal god of planet Earth. It's not at all what Paul is saying. And just in case this isn't convincing enough uh, to anyone here, I don't want anybody to, hear, to uh, leave here today thinking, oh my goodness, what are we ever going to do? God's been kicked out of planet Earth. Satan's in control. No. Nope. I want everyone to go home and rest well knowing that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Dear friends, God has not been kicked out of planet Earth. He is still on his throne. He is still in control. You and I are not. Thank God for that. Thank God for that. Now let's look at what the faith preachers teach about the person and work of Jesus Christ. If we can establish that they preach a different Jesus, we can establish that they do indeed preach a different gospel. Many of the faith preachers, though I want to say in intellectual honesty, not all of them, but many of them teach that Jesus did not come as God. That Jesus came just as another man. Another man, just like you and me, who had a very close walk with God, but was not actually God himself. Some would teach that Jesus later became God. Some would teach he became God when he was baptized. Others say well, he became God when he after he descended into hell and had to be reborn. But he was not actually God in Bethlehem. This is what Creflo Dollar said in his sermon, Jesus' Growth into Sonship. Here's what I want you to get here. If Jesus came as God, then why did God have to anoint him? Jesus came as a man. That's why it was legal to anoint him. Y'all please listen to me. Please listen to me. This ain't no heresy. I'm not some false prophet. Creflo Dollar teaches that Jesus did not come as God, just as another man who had to be anointed by God. We really begin to understand that, that, that when Jesus Christ paid the price, the first thing that happened after he said it is finished is the veil was rent from top to bottom, signifying that no man could do that. But the price that was paid was there's now no separation. So that we have direct access in the Holy of Holies. We understand, according to Hebrews, that Jesus is our high priest. Absolutely. And he's the first of many brethren, which means I now come into a priestly anointing. So I now can... Say that again because now, they don't get it. I now come into a priestly anointing. Jesus is not the only begotten on. Son of God. He is not. I'm a Son of he's God. He's the first fruit. You, you're the, he's the first fruit. He's the first born of many. Okay. Jesus is not the only begotten on. Son of God. This from Kenneth Copeland. Kenneth Copeland writes, or he teaches, he says, the word, of, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. What word? The word of the covenant that God cut with Abraham way back there years before. God was making promises to Jesus, and Jesus wasn't even there. But you see, God deals with things that are not yet, yet, are not yet as though they already were. Kenneth Copeland stunningly teaches that Jesus was not in existence until he became flesh in the manger in Bethlehem. He is denying the pre-existence of Jesus Christ. This is a different Jesus of the Bible. Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Consider this video clip from Kenneth Copeland. And Jesus volunteered to go to hell. I'm going to tell you something. Ain't nobody ever got out of there. The only thing he had to go by was the promise of God that I'm reading you right now. He didn't have some special revelation from heaven between he and God the Father. No, the Bible said he emptied himself when he came. And he saw himself in the word and said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He found himself in the word. So, according to Kenneth Copeland, Jesus was just another man who, who walked into church one day and started reading the Bible and went along and said, oh, Well, look here, I'll be John Brown. Look who I am. 
he found himself in the Word, had no idea who he was. He just found himself in the Word. Friends, that is a different Jesus of the Bible. If they preach a different Jesus, they preach a different gospel. And a different gospel does not save. This word faith teaching on the person and work of Jesus Christ is very similar to an ancient heresy known as monarchianism. It's very similar also to a heresy known as Arianism. Arianism held that Jesus did not come as God. He was just another man who had a very close walk with God but was not God himself. And Arianism was a struggle for the early church. It was something that the early church had to deal with. It came up for a vote in the Council of Nicaea in A.D. 325. And this heresy was voted down convincingly. And so um, the ancient church did away with this, the early church did away with this ancient heresy years ago, centuries ago. And yet the faith preachers want to hold on to it. Nothing new under the sun. The following is a prophecy given to Kenneth Copeland, supposedly from Jesus himself. According to Kenneth Copeland, Jesus himself physically appeared to him and gave him this prophecy. Quote, unquote, Jesus said to Kenneth, Don't be disturbed when people accuse you of thinking you are God. They crucified me for claiming that I was God, but I didn't claim I was God. I just claimed that I walked with him. He was in me. Hallelujah. That's what you're doing. Kenneth Copeland took some criticism for this false prophecy, and rightly so, and he went on TBN to try to explain it away. They're still questioning what was said about that prophecy. That prophecy never mentioned the Son of God. Never said anything about the Son of God. What did it say? It said, I did not claim to be God. Mm -hmm. That's all it said. In, in other words, in so many words, you're right. Nowhere in the New Testament did he literally get Preach up and, claim and he was say, God. I am God, did he? Now, no. I stand corrected. And the Christian attitude... Kenneth Copeland said, Jesus never claimed to be God. I beg to differ. Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. I and the Father are one. Jesus most certainly did claim to be God. And any Jesus that he's preaching that did not claim to be God is a different Jesus of the Bible. If they preach a different Jesus, they preach a different gospel. Friends, we're not talking here about the date of the Exodus or who wrote the book of Hebrews. These issues go to the heart of Orthodox Christianity. What one believes about Jesus Christ will determine where one spends eternity. Never to be done without, outdone with himself. This also from Kenneth Copeland. Kenneth Copeland says, And I say this with all respect so it don't upset you too bad, but I say it anyway. When I read in the Bible where he says, I am, I just smile and I say, I am too. Unbelievable. Now let us turn our attention to the spiritual death of Jesus. Pretty much all of the faith preachers teach this, that Jesus' physical death on the cross was not enough to atone for sins. He also had to die spiritually, where he suffered, was tormented in hell, had to be reborn, and that is where the atonement of our sins took place, not on the cross, but in hell. Jesus had to go through that same spiritual death in order to pay the price. Now, it wasn't the physical death on the cross that paid the price for sin, because if it had been, any prophet of God that had died for the last couple of thousand years before that could have paid that price. It wasn't physical death. Anybody could do that. Anybody could do that? Really? Dear friends, if you've sinned once, you couldn't do that. Physical death was not enough, says Kenneth Copeland. Why did Jesus then on the cross say, my God? Because God was not his father anymore. He took upon himself the nature of Satan. That is hard for me to even repeat, much less teach his truth. Jesus took upon himself the satanic nature. Fred Price. Satan was seated on his throne with a sickening grin on his face, his lip twisted in grotesque triumph, and all the imps of hell were dancing a jig. And the word came, we got him now, 
We've defeated the plan of God. And the devil was sitting there saying, I told you, if you'd follow me, I'd lead you to victory. We got him now. And they wrapped their grimy hands and the chains of hell itself around Jesus. And they consigned him to one of the cells in the Hades section of the underworld. And then Satan and his demon host went on a three-day drunk. They thought they had him. They had defeated and thwarted the plan of Almighty God. And Jesus sat there, as it were, immobile, not saying a word, not doing anything, except serving our sentence. Fred Price says that Jesus was helpless, couldn't do anything while, the, while Satan and his demonic hordes were tormenting and having their way with him. That is not the Jesus that I worship. From where does this doctrine originate, the spiritual death of Jesus doctrine? Well, it comes from our old friend Essek W. Kenyon. Kenyon one day was reasoning about sin this way, and he thought, well, sin is a spiritual problem, which of course it is. And he reasoned that a physical death could not possibly pay for a spiritual problem. So he thought there had to have been two deaths one physical and one spiritual of Jesus. So with this preconceived theology in mind, he then went to the Word and he, tar he started pouring through the Bible to try to find some verse to substantiate his doctrine, which, by the way, is the exact opposite way that we're supposed to read our Bibles. You see, you don't begin with your preconceived theology and then go try to find some verse to support it. That's called eisegesis, reading into the text. No, you begin with the Word of God and you get your doctrine and theology out from it, exegesis. You don't read into it, eisegesis, you get out from it, exegesis. But Kenyon thought he struck gold because he found Isaiah 53, 9, which says, And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. And Kenyon looked at this Messianic uh, prophecy here, looked at this verse, and he looked at this word that I have highlighted here, death. He got out his Hebrew grammar helps, and he looked this word up, and he said, aha, eureka, I have found it. This word, death, in the Hebrew is plural. So it must have meant there were two deaths, one physical and one spiritual. Well, you know what? In a sense, he's right. This is indeed a plural word. But the fact of the matter is, is that this is just one of literally dozens of examples in the Hebrew Old Testament of a plural word that refers to a singular antecedent. And that's exactly what we have here. It's just a quirk of Hebrew grammar. At the most, what you could say about this is that it is a plural of intensity, which means simply that the plurality of this verbs, this word just emphasizes the particular violence of the death. Not at all that there were two deaths. This is just a little nuance of Hebrew grammar. Nothing more and nothing less. So to Essek W. Kenyon, we have to say, nice try, but no cigar. This from Kenneth Copeland. He paid the price. He suffered so you and I don't have to go there. Now, if he hadn't suffered it in the spirit as well as the flesh, the flesh cannot make sacrifice for spiritual things. If the flesh could make sacrifice for spiritual things, then the, the, the flesh of animals would have gone a lot closer and a lot further than they did. The spirit then, Jesus' very own holy, pure, sinless spirit paid the sin price for your spirit. Why is this such a dangerous doctrine, the spiritual death of Jesus? Dear friends, if Jesus died spiritually, then that means he ceased to be God. And if Jesus ceased to be God even for an instant, then he never was God to begin with. Because God cannot cease being God. He is immutable. That means he does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Is that if there was ever a time when Jesus was not God, then he never was God to begin with. It was the physical death of Jesus that paid for our sins. The faith preachers hold so tenaciously to the spiritual death of Jesus 
It's very important for them because this, this goes to a doctrine known as identification. And according to word faith theology, we can identify with what Christ did in that Jesus, according to faith theology, died spiritually, separated from God, and had to be reborn, had to get saved. That's what happens to us. We are dead spiritually, and we are reborn through faith in Christ. We are saved. And so, therefore, according to Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagin, the believer is just as much an incarnation as was Jesus of Nazareth. So, therefore, we can have everything that Jesus has. We can do everything that Jesus can do. We should never be sick. It's all this identification doctrine, and it's related also to the little God's doctrine. They're all connected, this identification. So it was the physical death of Jesus that paid for our sins, not a spiritual death. Now, some of you may, may be wondering, well, didn't Jesus say on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Yes, he did. Let's look at this. Jesus did indeed say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's quoting Psalm 22, verse 1. And the faith preachers and even a lot of more mainstream evangelicals have taken this verse to say, Oh, well, Jesus was separated from God. And of course, if he was separated from God, he died spiritually. Now, first thing we need to notice, Jesus is quoting Psalm 22. And by quoting the first verse of Psalm 22, he is applying not only that verse to himself, he is also applying the entire context to himself, the entire passage, the entire chapter. Let's go on in Psalm 22. Verses 19 and verse 24 says, But be not thou far from me, O Lord, for he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. The psalmist was not completely separated from God. He felt estranged from God. Jesus was not separated from the Father. We see that from these two verses, verse 19, verse 24, the same chapter. At some level, I think we have to bend our knee and say that there's a certain mystery to what Jesus experienced on the cross. There's a certain mystery there that we can't fully understand. I think absolutely, Jesus in his humanity, okay, in his humanity, Jesus felt some estrangement from the Father when the wrath of God was being poured out on him. But in his deity, he was never separated from the Father. Never. What's the last thing that Jesus said on the cross. He said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. The very last thing that Jesus, Jesus said on the cross, he was, was a prayer. He was praying to the Father. So we know that those lines of communication within the triune Godhead were as much intact as they ever were. In his humanity, Jesus undoubtedly felt some estrangement, but not in his deity. There was never a time when Jesus was separated from the Father. There was never a time when Jesus ceased to be God. It was the physical death of Jesus that paid for our sins. What did Jesus say on the cross? It is finished. His work was completed on the cross. Very close to the spiritual death of Jesus doctrine is the faith preacher's teaching that Jesus was made sin. Not that he took our sin, he was literally made sin. He was literally turned into sin and therefore, of course, died spiritually. It's similar to the Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation, if I can draw an analogy here. Catholics believe that when you take communion and you take the little wafer, what they call the host, and you put it on your tongue, that it literally turns into the flesh of Jesus Christ. And when you drink the wine, it literally turns into his blood. In a similar vein, the faith preachers teach that when Jesus was on the cross, he literally turned into sin, metamorphosized into sin. This from Kenneth Copeland. He became sin. He was made sin. Now he's in the pit of hell. He's down there. He's in there. Suffering like no man has ever suffered. 
death and all of, all of hell's emissaries have piled in there on him to annihilate this one called the Son of God. Do you remember what happened in the desert when Israel was bitten by those snakes? And God told Moses, put a serpent on the pole. And the Bible said this was a type of Jesus. Now I want you to know, I don't mind telling you, that made me, that, that irritated me. I didn't like that a bit. I went to the Lord about it. I said, I don't like this. He said, what is it you don't like? I said, I don't like, I don't like that serpent, that snake, the thing that, that's an illustration of Satan being put up there and you say that's a type of Jesus. He said, you will and you understand what it meant. I said, well, what did it mean? He said, when he bore your sickness, he was made sin with your sin. Jesus was made sin. Is there any scriptural support for this? Well, the faith preachers would say yes, and upon first consideration, again, it might would seem so. Second Corinthians 5.21, He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Well, it doesn't say right there that Jesus was made sin. Well, not exactly. Let's be good Bereans. Search the scriptures to see if these things are really so. The word in question here that is rendered as sin in the Greek is the word hamartia. And hamartia may be rendered as sin. It may also, however, be rendered as sin offering. How do you know which is correct? You know which is correct by the context of the passage. And I want us to look at the context of this passage by looking at another text which uses this same verse. This is what from the uh, Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Yet it was the will of the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief when he makes himself an offering for sin. It's the very same word, the word homartia, but yet here it is rendered as sin offering. The context of this is the Old Testament sacrificial system. And in the Old Testament, when an animal was sacrificed, that animal had to be pure and holy before it was sacrificed, it had to remain pure and holy on the altar while it was being sacrificed. And it had to remain pure and holy after the sacrifice. Jesus was the ultimate fulfillment of that for us. Dear friends, Jesus was holy before the cross. Jesus was holy on the cross. Jesus remains holy today after the cross. Jesus did not turn into sin. He was made an offering for our sin. There is a big, big difference. The Bible is very clear that it was the physical death of Christ that paid for our sins. Jesus died, he was buried, he was raised, and he appeared. Peter writes, For Christ also died for sins how many times? Once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Literally in the Greek, made alive by the Spirit of God. More Bible proof. The Apostle Paul writes, much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. It was the physical death of Jesus that paid for our sins. One thing that you'll notice about every cult Every cult disparages the cross of Jesus Christ, that it somehow just isn't enough to pay for sins. Mormons disparage it. Jehovah's Witnesses disparage it. Those people who call themselves Christians that, that teach a work salvation disparage the cross. And sadly, the word faith preachers disparage the cross of our Lord Christ. Our last video clip of this session is one of the more disturbing ones I've seen from Kenneth Copeland. Uh, consider this and listen very carefully to what he says here. You can't break the new covenant. You can get out of fellowship with it, but you can't break it. It's between God and Jesus. <laughs> and he comes and puts your, your, his arm around you and says, Now, little brother, now let me tell you something now. Uh, you be my joint heir. If you'll let me run your life for you and just be obedient to me. The same thing that happened to me in hell, I'll cause to happen to you in your spirit right now. Hallelujah. 
I got resurrected, you get resurrected. I got filled with the Holy Ghost, you get filled with the Holy Ghost. I got a glorified body, you get a glorified body. I have a covenant with my Father, and uh, you can get in on my part. <laughs> I'll give you my covenant with Him. And even when you mess up, keep your mouth shut yes. and come to me. That's right. yes. That's right. Repent the thing before me and I'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I won't even let him know you did Hallelujah. it. Do you see what Kenneth Copeland just did? Kenneth Copeland has now pitted God the Son against God the Father. And now God the Son is keeping secrets from God the Father. Now let's carry this out to its logical conclusion. If Jesus is keeping secrets from the Father, then that means there are things that the Father does not know, which means he is not omniscient, and that's not the God of the Bible. And any Jesus who's keeping secrets from the Father is not the Jesus of the Bible. If they preach a different Jesus, they preach a different gospel. And a different gospel does not save. I want us to return to this passage of Scripture that Peter writes to us. I think it will have even more meaning for us now. Peter writes, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the Master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be maligned. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Peter writes, and he says, false prophets arose among the people. There will be false teachers among you. And notice, how are they going to introduce these destructive heresies? With flags a-waving, guns a-blazing? No, secretly introduce the destructive heresies. They will have some truth. Remember the illustration of water. But they'll mix in that, with that truth, error and heresy to corrupt the entire thing secretly introducing the destructive heresies to fly in under our spiritual radars, even denying the master who bought them. Any man who would teach that Jesus did not come as God is denying the Jesus of the Bible. Any man who would teach that Jesus is keeping secrets from the Father, denying the Jesus of the Bible, bringing swift destruction upon themselves who just don't yet know it. Many will follow their sensuality. This movement is large and it's growing. And because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. What way of truth is that? The truth of the gospel of our Lord Christ is being maligned. It's being distorted, drugged through the mud by these false teachers. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. The King James says they will make merchandise out of you. All of the faith preachers are opulently wealthy. And they are making merchandise out of God's people. Every phrase fits to a T what we see today in the modern prosperity gospel, every phrase. And the last word in this session we will give to Kenneth Copeland. I'm telling you folks, this is serious, but this is serious, but this is serious, but... On that, we agree. This is serious business. I hope this has been helpful to you. And again, it is my prayer that this seminar will help equip you to do what Ephesians 4.15 tells us to do, to speak the truth in love.